So I'll begin with uh, an, an introduction. Um, so Professor Laura Wexler, uh, well, Laura Wexler is Professor of American Studies, Professor of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and co-chair of the Women's Faculty Forum at Yale University. She holds an affiliation with the Film Studies Program, the Program in Ethnicity, Race and Migration, and the Public Humanities Program. So please welcome today, Professor Laura Wexler. Thank you, Laura, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, for the invitation and Emmett for the tech help and Billy, can I say Billy for the also Absolutely. The and every face in a glowing box that's on here, all my companions, longtime interlocutors and new readers and new responders. It's very wonderful for me to see you. So, um, Laura Wexler works on the social life of photographs. So what does that mean? It took me a while to come up with that sentence um, because um, it, it is not so clear if you allow your work to be photographically driven, it is not so clear what the overarching category of the work is. That is, it's not allied to any particular field I'm not an art historian. I'm not a, a, an intellectual or cultural historian, except by practice, I suppose. I started as a photographer, but I'm not a practitioner of photography at the moment. And um, uh, my, my work has been driven by these episodes of engagement with particular photographs. Um, I very much believe that inquiry into what is photography, which is the topic of your seminar this year, is um, needs to be driven by photographs and that we do not have the academic fields into which singularly that inquiry would be would be housed. And so it's of necessity um, a, a trans topic, a trans, a, it, 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 it's multidisciplinary and crosses borders. That doesn't mean that one's engagement is less scholarly, but it means that one's ability to name one's engagement doesn't necessarily fit into the kind of index of fields. So it's taken me a long time to come up with that sentence. Um, and even further to come up with what I mean by it. So in thinking about introducing this to you today, um, I thought about what kind of social lives photographs have. And I think photographs have three kinds of social lives. The first is as a social object. And we study photographs as a social object. We study their circulation, their the, mo the modes of production, the relations of production, we study their reception, we study their exchange, um, we study them in relation to art history, we, we, they are now objects of inquiry for us. And uh, that's, those objects of inquiry are socially constructed and we study that. That's the first life as a social object. The second life is as a social structure. That is following the work of Ariella Azoulay and my colleagues on the collaboration project and others we live inside of photography. We live photography with one another. We, we are social, um, our social structure is now uh, probably in, inalienable from photography. Um, and um, that's a profound shift from studying photographs as objects to studying the conditions under which we together live photography. Okay, so that's the second life, photography as a social structure. But the third is the one that is actually why I'm usually so tentative about sharing work in progress. I don't know quite the name of it, but for you for today, I called it photography as social theft. Photographs, seek to make something invisible by making other things visible. And what is made invisible is generally has to do with relations of power. And photographs take things from us as well as give us things. 
they take things socially mediated things social social things from us this is not quite the same as the literary critical idea of di you know diagnostic reading remember we're symptomatic reading where we learn to as literary critics which i originally i suppose was um because my degrees in english and comparative literature my 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 phd degree we 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 started to do symptomatic reading we were looking for um we were looking to deconstruct language we were looking for things that were missing in the text we were looking for things that were over emphasized in a text we were diagnosing and finding um symptomatic symptoms in text it's not quite that i actually mean that photographs participate in social theft they participate in the theft of well-being of others they participate in the absencing of archives they participate in the non-tellability of stories. And they also provide threads to these thefts. <laughs> they provide a way of locating these thefts. So my engagement has always really been mostly with these, what I'm calling just for today, I don't know if I'll stick with it or not, theft. Photography as social theft. And um, it, it's, um, until I've thought it all out, it makes me uneasy. But I usually start with a particular photograph that's puzzling to me. And it is the theft, I think, that is performed by that photograph that I think I'm looking for. So why don't we, why don't I share my screen? Because I made a little PowerPoint. We'll see if it manages to make this more clear. Um, this is a photograph that started tender violence. Um, and um, actually, the scene, which I have analyzed and others have analyzed, and most recently, Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer in school photos and in liquid time, I've also brilliantly analyzed this photograph. The, th the thing that bothered me here was not so much the social scene, which I which is profoundly interesting and threatening, but the the doors, the windows, the archway, the light in the building. Because when I started to look at the Hampton album. This is Francis Benjamin Johnson's, one of Johnson's photographs that uh, was included in the Museum of Modern Art uh, publication of the Hampton album. Um, what I noticed was that the architecture of this room, um, look at the door, look at the transom, look at the windows, look at the lights, um, was repeated the architecture of my high school in Newton, Massachusetts, which was also built right after the Civil War. Um, and um, it was the space and the, the fact that sitting in that high school at desks that looked like this, um, not in all the rooms, but in some of them, in building one, <laughs> um, I remembered the light reflected on the windows. I remembered the dust motes in the afternoon and the sunlight angled. I remembered what it was to congregate in a space like this. I remembered the wood. And what I realized was that I had never been told not just the history of the country, but the history of the spaces in which I grew up. It turned out that high school was built on abolitionist ground by post-war industrialists who were allied with the Hampton Institute and other mechanical institutes in the South, trying to create a, educated, a population that would be educated so as to labor in their factories and their domestic spaces. Something was stolen, a story was gone, and a story became partially visible through my work with these photographs. 
Um, I'm trying to move forward. Ah, okay. Um, the essay you read, The Purloined Image, which makes a reference to theft in uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, short story, The Purloined Image, the, the theft of the letter, which is right out there in, uh, right out there, obvious to see. Um, the absent, uh, we've all been, we've all been uh, transfixed by this really, the absent images, image in camera lucida of the winter garden photograph Roland Barthes mother at the age of five um, uh, is a is a a kind of theft <laughs> from us he says no you can't have it uh, we say no no it's ours <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that one but um, this is one of the winter garden photographs of uh, Roland Barthes' little girl mother and her big brother um, that I realized was taking our eyes off of, that, that in, in, in taking away from us the picture that is generating his work, he is literally taking our eyes off of the main chance, what we actually need to look at, which is the colonial history of his family, which is transferred not by his mother, but by her brother who holds the patronym, Banger, who, who then becomes, if you were able to read my essay, we could probably recapitulate it, the thread by which we can reconstruct uh, an entire story behind the colonial, um, uh, the theft of colonial history that lies behind camera lucida. Um, and then uh, again, um, the Chinese albums uh, essay, um, which I'm so grateful for Erna Dugan and Tifu uh, for helping me for many years to, by mentoring me and helping me for many years to understand what's at stake in that essay. Um, it's this photograph um, that started the work. Um, and um, what this photograph is, is I spent, uh, in 2008, I spent half a year teaching in Beijing I taught the first, uh, what, what they said was the first course on photography, history, and memory to have been taught um, in Beijing. Uh, the, the newspapers came uh, to register that. It was an extremely exciting moment in 2008. Uh, China was opening up. They had had the Olympics. We got there right after the right right at the time of the Special Olympics. Actually, it was right before a whole slew of scandals hit the government, and the government was very proud of its um, its international uh, footprint at that time. And I started uh, I started interviewing um, people about their family photographs. I taught a, I taught a course on family photographs. I was told the students would never show any. I was told they didn't exist. I was told no one would ever share them. All of this was not true. Most of what I was told in order to prepare me to go and teach in Beijing was not true. And the students wrote back to their families. This is at Beida, Peking University. The students wrote back to their families all over the country. The family sent photographs in so they could be shared in this class. The students made albums out of these photographs. And that started me collecting photographic albums in the Panjian Yuan market and other markets in villages and cities in China. And it started me interviewing uh, Chinese people about their, or, uh, talking to them about their, their family photographs. Um, and uh, in a little tiny village in Wuhan, a man uh, came uh, out uh, of his house and said that he wanted to show me his photographs. And he went into a, a drawer uh, in his back room and he came out with this balled up newspaper and he undid it. And these were his, uh, his photographs. So 
uh, the question was like, well, um, you know, why, why was this story stolen? Why, why was I giving, why was I being given a, a stolen story? What are, what is going on with family photographs from the Mao generation? And uh, in, for 10 years, I went back and forth many times, seven, eight, nine times um, to collect and to uh, talk with people. And then it took uh, many years to figure this out and to develop the idea that's in the essay of a chrysalis archive, which I'm very happy to talk about with you. So, um, uh, and then my most recent work, um, is that is the works in progress essay. <laughs> it was begun by this photograph, the Chopin Plantation House after the construction of the TP Railroad. Um, long time ago, either Oxford or Cambridge University Press commissioned me, asked me to write a new introduction to Kate Chopin's book, The Awakening, which those of you who are second wave feminists will remember it used to be a big deal. The students could care less about it now, uh, which is very interesting. But um, and um, in doing what and, and so it looked to me like most of the critical introductions were recapping what the earlier critical introductions had said. So I did what I normally do, which, which is like such a big mistake half the time, which is to do research. And what I found out was that Kate Chopin's husband was a founding member of the White League in Louisiana, that he had fought in the Battle of Liberty Place in which people were killed and ended reconstruction in, in Louisiana, which then ended reconstruction in the rest of the country, and that they had then moved to Natchitoches, Louisiana, uh, where he continued his White League activity, as did all of her friends, neighbors, and relatives, and that the story of Chopin that we learned from The Awakening is very much a partial story. Um, again, something about the way that we share stories and photographs is stealing from us stories that we need to know. And this picture, which nobody can locate now, and but it was published once, um, is of the Chopin plantation uh, after the construction of the, it's the TP, the Texas and Pacific, Tran Trans-Pacific Railroad or the Texas and Pacific, I can't remember. I originally thought that this was a bid for reparations because Confederate plantation owners sued the federal government for reparations for damage to their plantations and many got financial reparations from the federal government that I initially thought this is what this was. It turns out it, that this is not what it was, but if you look very carefully and I can't, I don't have the technology now to show it to you, but you can look, can you see my cursor? If you look very carefully in the exact middle of this photograph, you, you'll have to believe me, there's a black man sitting by the tracks and next to these small cabins, there are black families and the African-American history of the region is also indexed in this photograph. It literally was not visible to me for years. Um, and then when I was working on the collab project with Wendy, Susan, Lee and Ariella, and we were working on our, our the number, the, the first idea, which is that the photographed person is always there. I looked with this clue at this photograph and indeed I found that the photographed persons who had been invisible to me for probably a decade and a half um, are still there, They're, they are always there. So it's this concatenation of, um, well, I don't know, um, theft really, um, <laughs> theft of stories, theft of the past, um, that I that I somehow get interested in in a particular photograph and um, that's what starts me going. Um, I've developed a mode of working 
All, any of my students will know what this is. Uh, the assignment is always find a set, find a text, read the set against the text. I'm just gonna go very quickly through this um, because the Yale Libraries last year was closed down by COVID before we got to have the symposium about it. But in honor of this work, created an exhibition about this. Um, and this is the exhibition, this is, you know, but find a set, find a text, read the set against the text. Um, and this is, uh, this is what the exhibition looked like. This is how, that's Leo and Marianne came to visit. Um, this is how uh, I have figured out to work with this. This is something else. Um, Francis Benjamin Johnston, um, this work, uh, I'm just going really carefully through here, but it turns out that Francis Benjamin Johnston spent the last years of her life photographing ruined plantation houses throughout the South, supported by the Carnegie Foundation, and that in looking so carefully at the Hampton album, we are rendering invisible the celebration of the Old South, um, and also the queer friends and queer photographic community that she had joined in New Orleans. Um, and then finally, this is Kate. Uh, and I'm now very suspicious of these photographs because the work in progress that you read with the photograph of Fainer Brazil, Fainer is Kate Chopin's brother-in-law and she credited him with giving her the story of the awakening. So I think that probably gives you some sense of what I mean by the social life of photographs. Photographs as a social object, we know we study this, it's very rich, we couldn't work without that, but that's not quite what this is. And photographs as a social structure, again, we, I certainly live within photography as a social structure. That is so much of my life is, uh, it, it, it is rendered collegial and collaborative by the social structures of photography. But photography as theft, what is, what is stolen here by this image? And how can we use the image to solve the crime? So, with that said, that's my introduction. <laughs> Hi, um, everybody. Hi. Hi, Laura. And um, let me let me just you. say thank you to Dana because her invitation. You were my very first Zoom travel invitation <laughs> to your class, and I just want to say thank you again for that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, thank you. Your gift to my uh, your visit to my seminar last semester was, I think, the gift that kept on giving all semester. <laughs> discussions through the final projects um through people's subsequent work um, and i think i mean i i remain so fascinated by including um uh other things that the discussion that that we had of that photograph the, the photograph on the chopin um plantation right and so sort of a way to come back maybe at, at billy's question about intoxicality right um but I think my question first is, again, I was struck by the sort of deployment of theft here, right? And I know there's a concept you're still sort of working through. Um, and maybe to build on Billy's um, comments and to come at it um, from another angle, I think one of the things about the sort of um, the question of indexicality is that the notion of theft produces the matter of the photograph, right? Um, whatever that might be, the world of the photograph, the matter of the photograph as, as property, in a sense or as ideally property, like the thing we should have or the thing we should have had. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm thinking about, um, I, you know, it maybe I think it is problematic in some ways. I've been reading for other work, a lot of indigenous land theory, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about, for example, Robert Nichols just recently published a book. I don't know if you know it called Theft is Property, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, right. And so, you know, and, and Nichols's understanding of, of the sort of taking Right, like what you would call theft, you would call dispossession, right? Which is an act that confers, like constructs the very right. notion of possession yeah. and taking. Um, and the sort of indigenous politics is a politics of counter dispossession, right? And I wondered if that, because you move across different milieus and different contexts of what might constitute what gets claimed as property in the act of 
theft, right? So I wonder if counter dispossession or dispossession might be um, a, a more um, perhaps accurate framework to what you're saying than theft or more fruitful. And I guess part of my question in that was, um, right, um, in relation to that was still why you see it as not symptomatic reading what you're doing right um uh um because to come back to the jameson i think one of the the points about uh, the statement of history as what hurts is that if symptomatic reading if we're, if we're sort of taking it as this sort of like synecdoche for critique in general right like and one of the things that the critique of critique is trying to turn against is this emphasis right on loss on the negative on you know um but it seems to me like symptomatic reading is a mode of learning to be hurt, right? Like for, you know, so if, if you are a certain kind of viewer, some photographs are just gonna hurt you, right? Um, the photograph that you showed that started tender violence, like it just sort of automatically hurt a lot of people and a lot of people just look at it, right? You know, consume it in the way it was going to be consumed or just glance at it and, and be indifferent to it. And the practice of a kind of critical reading is, is learning to be hurt, learning what is hurtful about that photograph, right? Um, but yeah, I guess I guess the part of the question is sort of why you see your kind of understanding photography as that as other, um, other than symptomatic reading. Like what what more is uh, do you desire to be present in that gesture? Well, what it's a wonderful thoughts, Dana. And first, let me say that absolutely, this I think that uh, indigenous theory about possession and dispossession is very rich here and does absolutely critique property relations. And um, I guess I'm not thinking, I think that property relations apply to the people whose work I'm looking at. So I, I think that it's very much about, I think that post reconstruction in Louisiana in Natchitoches is very much about property relations. It's also further back about Choctaw dispossession, but it's about this killing is about property relations. And I think that I, 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 uh, I think that, uh, for instance, uh, Tamara Lanier's challenge to Harvard University about the Agassi photographs of Renty and Delia and the other people on uh, the South Carolina plantation. Uh, those of you that don't know this, she sued Harvard for to give her back the photographs that the Peabody own, uh, says it owns uh, of uh, someone who is her great, great, great grandfather, Renty. These are photographs you, many of you know, and she's been able to trace the genealogy to her family. And she is saying they are hers and property law in these, so far as all of I can understand of all the lawyers I've interviewed say that US property law says they are not hers. And the judge just ruled in that case that they are not, that he threw the hearing out. I think it's probably not over. I, I think that to move directly to dispossession in these instances is to leap over the legal struggles and the legal infrastructure that creates this as property in the first place. And I don't want to do that so quickly. But I but I I do I I take very much to heart what you're saying and um, there's a lot of really important new work and the, the younger scholars among you are, are often doing that. Uh, that's exactly about, about this. So I, I'm, I, I, I agree, I need to think it through more, um, but I, right now I wanna double down on the word theft because um, dispossession is theft. <laughs> And these, these are not nice, this is not nice. I mean, what's going on in Nakedash is frightening now. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to ask you uh, about then um, photography after freedom and the part we read for today, the draft that we've been talking about. 
Could you tell us how it fits into the larger project? I can, uh, given what you've worked on and how you've worked on it and, and what you've told us about the three registers of the social life of photography, um, I think we get an idea, but could you tell us maybe about the other material that you'll be looking at, the structure, the, perhaps the larger goal that you hope to, uh, to realize in this study? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, this is, so this is not, <laughs> this is not a new project. This is a project I've been struggling to understand for maybe 15 years. Um, but uh, the title photography after freedom uh, is, is a new, is a new approach to it. Um, people are now interested and increasingly knowledgeable about what happened in Louisiana uh, during Reconstruction. Um, and um, Philip Foner and other historians have pointed to how important this was because although Reconstruction was defeated basically by what happened in Louisiana, um, it provided the basis for the next reconstruction, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And then as we see the game plan for the 2020 election and the invasion of the Capitol actually follows what happened in Louisiana where, where it was, there were two governors, they claimed the elections were fraud, they, I mean, it, it's, it's so, so in what Philip Goff calls the need for the third reconstruction, we have this game plan happening again. So partly I just want to tell the story, which can be told through photographs. But also I increasingly think about where it, the story went <laughs> and what, how it was that this incredible violence and you know i only shared a piece of it in the short excerpt that i sent to you there's something called the kushada massacre there's something called the colfax massacre there's i mean it's absolutely i mean it is staggering violence and if you go to the lynching memorial in montgomery and the lynching museum you see they're counting the numbers but the numbers are way undercounted. Um, and they actually don't start till the end of Reconstruction. And so the story is just incredible. And um, I just have a very basic, I've been wanting to tell this story. Can I say that it has not been easy to tell the story? Um, I, a lot of people don't want the story to be told. I've been, I've been told, why would you wanna remember that? Why, you know, what does it have to do with you? Um, all, all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of opposition, including my own, it's like, uh, to this, uh, telling this. And, um, but I do, I think this, we're increasingly able to tell this story, but what we don't know is where the story went. So that second wave feminists get Kate Chopin as our lost heroine. And how does that happen and why? Um, so I think it's actually the reconsolidation after the end of Reconstruction that I want to look at. The idea about, well, come on now, let's all just get together and how photography functioned in that. So some of you know that I've been interested in the long span of photographs that Frederick Douglass had taken of himself. And I'm particularly interested in the later ones. How is he imagining his symbolic image at a time when everything he stood for is being denounced and renounced. How is it that he keeps photographing himself in, the, in a, a very similar manifestation to when he first uh, stole himself basically, uh, or left the, whatever the right word is, he became out of slavery fought for his freedom. He 
photographs himself in an unending arc till the end of his life, near the end of the century. But what's happening around him is changing vitally. And I think that Kodak, I think that Andrew Carnegie, I think that the popularization of photography, the rendering innocent images like Feynor's or like Kate's have to do with where the story went. So I'm just trying to see this in the, I'm just trying to see it. So there's much more material in this book, um, but I have, you know, but it right now, as I wrote to you, it exists in pieces. So I'm not sure that I can put it together in a, in a pricey. Uh, I can't, I, I really can't just yet, but we, you know, photography originally, according to Douglas and others, was going to be a mode of freedom. And for Douglas, as I've argued elsewhere, he believed that, photo, that photography was essential to freeing African-Americans from their shackle, from slavery. He believed that photographs of black men that showed them as men would help the country and Lincoln arm black men in the service of the federal government. He believed that it had these photographs had an instrumental role to play, a social role to play for freedom. But all of that gets walked back in the late, in the 1880s and 1890s and early 1900s. Uh, not, not all of it, but much of it gets walked back. And I'm interested to see, I, there's not very much written about photography during that period. It's as if we skip from abolition and the Civil War and the post-Civil War right to the 20s and the 30s and the Depression. But what, what has happened in the intervening time with photographs so that everybody, you know, this terrible thing that colonialism and post-colonialism says was, okay now, well, that's over. <laughs> now let's just get on with things. Why can't we all just be friends? And I think we can't all just be friends in part because of what photography, the wounds that photography actually produces. So I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm wondering why Kate Chopin becomes the heroine that she does become locally as well as nationally. There's something in Natchitoches called the Melrose Plantation, um, which is a kind of a, the, the women, the women in Natchitoches took over culture starting in the 1880s and 90s and produced these sort of cultural sites. Francis Benjamin Johnson photographing the old South architecture. How is it that they are going along with the, well, all right, now that's over. How is it that they're finding empowerment in that? And what is it that still wants to tell the story? Why is Kate still a heroine? I actually think it's because she gets out of there. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I, you know, I, um, I haven't written, I, I, it's very much in pro, you asked for in progress, this is, my mind in progress. Well, yeah, which is fantastic. It's great to see yeah. that work in progress. And, and, yeah. and clearly, I think you've already established that photography is playing a key role yeah. in problems of obfuscation, as well as display when it comes to lynchings, for example. Yeah. And this is, this is a very fraught kind of history. I'm glad you're telling. But Andres, you write about, I mean, Germany. I mean, what you, this is something that you must have thought about deeply. Can you share some of your thinking and particularly about the post-war social contract to not look at photograph family albums, to yeah. read photographs? To, I mean, what does one do with this history and how does it disappear? Yeah, I think, I, so I, I've always been attracted to the historical problems of Germany because I recognize them here in Louisiana. And I felt that familiarity allowed me to maybe ask questions that folks I may had already asked and had interesting answers for, or maybe didn't ask. And um, 
Yeah. Uh, someone here, Matthias Falla, uh, there are a couple of folks from Germany here who could maybe add to this uh, somewhere along the way, but uh, there are, um, there is a kind of disavowal in the late 40s and through the 50s, like, oh, I don't want to know what my parents did, and uh, maybe I don't want to see the albums that they brought back from the front, let's hide these. Um, that changes, however, in the 60s, especially by 68, and then there's a kind of confrontation with the refrain more or less being, we don't have fathers, we only have grandfathers. And that was the kind of rediscovery of the Weimar era, which jumps over yeah. the Nazi era and produces a kind of similar disavowal. And I, this is happening again and again here in Louisiana as well on similar terms. But the, um, the photography of the immediate post-war era is uh, something I suggested along with, uh, with the help of Andreas Hoysen is um, also an act of uh, disavowal because the, photos of ruins rarely talk about the cause of those ruins. Mm. And um, there's this general idea that there was an amnesia, historical mm. amnesia after the mm. Second World War, but that's now being challenged and there are different stories being written now. But you see, yeah. that, that's the kind of thing you can write as well, Laura, because there may be strands of recognition and, and photographic realizations that work with the history as it's unfolding and um, disclose the kinds of operations that you wrote about in the portrait of this notable man. Uh, who who you, became a state senator and then national, I think, representative. He helped write the Jim Crow Constitution of Louisiana. He has an illustrious career afterwards. And the Melrose Plantation, which Cami Henry founded as a kind of cultural site of folk practices, um, Cammie Henry, so one set of things I'm working with is Cammie Henry has the Cammie Henry archive. She kept scrapbooks all her life. There must be 40 of them. They're in the LSU, uh, not the LSU, they're in, yeah, they're in the library at the Cammie Henry Research Center. And um, she was tracking Hitler and, and she's clipping, she's, I don't, I have to get there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm working with the Cammie Henry albums. Um, that's the 1880s through the 1930s. And then Francis Benjamin Johnston shows up at photographing at Melrose and living in New Orleans. So I, I'm something was taken about our understanding of this. Not everyone's mine. Okay, mine. <laughs> and uh, photographs, yeah, so I've said it. But. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I, I really like um, this project uh, personally because my, my dad's family is actually hails from Louisiana before the Great Migration. Um, and then professionally, I really, so I like the concept of social theft. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at Rutgers um, in sociology and a sociologist of punishment um, and social control. And I use comparative historical methods. So when, when thinking through um, your work and, and when hearing you talk, the reason I like social theft is because it's direct um, and it points to the fact that institutions often have intentions. And I think that when we write about them, we can write about them in ways that um, sort of hide or, or gloss over intentionality. And so even in my own work um, in, on social control, I write uh, in direct you know, pushback against scholars who use language such as collateral consequences, right? The violent collateral consequences. And I say, no, if we, if we go all the way back to Du Bois, um, when he's writing in Black Reconstruction, we see that he talks about formal institutions of social control as racially um, intentious, right? Inten having intentions. Yeah. And so I think um, sort of, like leaning into theft as sort of centering the fact that are we, uh, maybe it, we shouldn't only be thinking of photography as sort of, of, of the collateral consequences of photographs, but maybe positioning them more directly as being used um, with intent. I think that that is why I like, I like this idea of theft. Um, and I think in terms of providing context, at least for myself when writing about racist intentions, I've found Du Bois work um, which fits the time period you're looking at. And then also um, Ida B. Wells' work, because in particular, she has that famous quote that um, 
I, I don't want to misquote it. I probably will, but I'll paraf paraphrase. But, you know, those who commit the murders write the reports. So I think that sort of using that kind of framing, and she's talking about lynching um, and how it's occurring through formal institutions of social control. So I, I, I like this. Um, and I think maybe uh, using language around intent and inciting those early Black scholars um, in sort of setting up the scaffolding for the argument. I think um, would build it up even further, but I think yeah. it's really great. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for the comment on absolutely citing those scholars. Um, so Gabrielle Foreman and uh, Jim Carrey uh, have just published <clears throat> the first volume from the Colored Conventions Project. I don't know if you know what this project is. It's a digital humanities project. It turns out that from the 1930s to the turn of the century, there were yearly colored conventions locally, statewide, and nationally, the record of which was lost, <laughs> dispersed, sometimes in church. You know what? I mean, I, I now understand what a church fire is about in a way that I hadn't understood it before. I found Mr. Blunt, and I uh, and they uh, spent many the past number of years finding and digitizing the archives one by one of these colored conventions. Uh, it's, it's a digital humanities project, very important, called the Colored Conventions Project, and people were from the 1830s on meeting together, traveling to meet together. So think about that, you know, in the years before the automobile and the green book, how did black people travel to national conventions? Where did they stay? There are minutes of these conventions and the minutes were either lost or kept in the churches, which were the places mainly where they were able to meet or published in fragments in the press. When we, and they figured out, they crowdsourced the digitization of this. They have figured out an incredible way of presenting this work, and it, it's only just begun. This history was disappeared. To, and, and in you know, so is it always intentional in each act? No, but in, it often is intentional. And the result of it is a spectrum of intentionality that, that means that we don't have the information we desperately need now. And so the black, I, I, um, I'm trying to work with Gabrielle in that project in order to tie the visuality that I'm talking about at this time to the colored conventions where there are thinkers, there are speeches, there are solutions, there are proposals, there are petitions, there's this entire writing and political life that engages with this. And in the later years, it overlaps with popular photography. Uh, and so that's one of, when, when Andres says, what are your other materials? That's one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do. But um, why, why should photography confirm us in the boundaries that we, within which we already live? If we think about it as intentional, it allows us to escape and ask different questions. And, and absolutely it's resonant with Du Bois. Um, yeah, thank you for your, where in Louisiana is your family from? Um, my, my dad's family's from Monroe. From Monroe, okay. Yeah, well, you know, another thing going on is that people who left during the great migration, the grandchildren great-grandchildren are beginning to ask questions about the family album and finding the stories that have been too terrifying and too hurtful to tell. And, and I, I hope that this typology for working with photographs is a way that people can approach the telling of, it's some kind of structure for the telling of these stories, the, the, the chrysalis archive, the archive yet to be, the archive waiting to be born, the archive waiting until it's safe enough to come out. This is, this is happening and that's where this, that's where this work is trying to uh, be a companion. 
Thank you, Brittany. Uh, Zainab? Yeah, um, thank you, Laura, for sharing your work. And thank you, Brittany, for that comment, because I, I think um, my comment question follows on that. And in that, I, I really, I think it's very exciting to, to have the opportunity to read somebody's new work, especially when it's somebody who I think for, for many people here today, you know, you shaped a lot of the ways that we think about photographs or look at photographs. And so, um, um, you know, it, 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 that's, that's exciting to have an opportunity to look at work that, that's still in formation. Um, so on that note, and because I think you've, you've said several times about how one of the motivating factors in this work is about telling the stories and, and then, you know, the paying attention to the how a story is told as well as the which stories is, is told. Um, as I was reading the opening of this and you know, he, he, he opens and the something is amiss. The amiss is it was the wrong dead man. And I get that that is the historical amiss for Brazil. But of course, I take it for granted that that is not the historical amiss for you, that presumably it would have been wrong for any man to have been hanging from a tree, whether it was the right man or the wrong man. And so I wonder about why start the telling of this story in this manner? Because when I read it this way, my immediate reaction was if only they had had a photograph, then such a mistake would not have been made, would it have? They would have had the photograph of the right man that they wanted to hang in a tree. Which is of course then what we know to have happened in so many different cultural contexts. Yeah. And so I just wanted to sort of put that out there as a suggestion for, for me that made the opening of this piece troubling. Yeah. Um, and 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 like in the, I, I mean, I, I think this chapter is very rich and very interesting, and I'm so excited to read more of the work. And and one particular part that really immediately grabbed me was when the captain of the guards, you know, when asked had anything occurred, says nothing except a party took a man and hung him. And I thought, you know. That's one of the challenges I think we face as scholars of photography is that nothing is rarely photographed. And what we end up spending so much of our research trying to write about or research or discover is the accept. And I feel like there's a lot in the nothing, the nothing except this man was taken and hung. And it, it makes, to your question, not about what happened, but to what happened that these stories are not remembered, right? Or the, I, I really loved how you started by saying, how could I have been sitting in, the, in a classroom that looked just like this building and have had no idea of these, the history of these places? I think understanding the nothing is really important to understanding the making of forgetting. And I mean, um, well, I, you know, their works, um, I always reference uh, Sarkasova and Shevchenko yeah, who are both here, here today yeah. whenever I'm talking Very about this, but it's the, right. the sort of the, the making of, uh, of oblivion in this way. I think understanding that nothing is really important, but again, given that we're challenged by the limits of the material that we work with, how is photography scholars when the photographs are almost always of, I don't know if this is what Billy was referencing when he talked about uh, catastrophes, but how when the photographs are almost always of the accept, do we really think through the nothing or work with the nothing? And there, that's where I thought, you know, what's really like, what would it mean to start with the, 
with the totally benign looking portrait and not the case of the missing identity. Because I couldn't help but but have that thought of like, oh, if only I had, they had the photograph, they would have gotten the right person. But well, why is that a bad thought for you to have? Um, what it reinforces is the rightness of anybody to be hanging from that tree. Um, I know something's upsetting about the opening. Um, and I appreciate your saying it and it's you're definitely right and it's definitely in those words i haven't figured it out yet i i uh so sadia hartman talks about critical fabulation in which she and we take everything we can know she's an inc incredible scholar and then she basically kind of inhabits it it's an interesting verb tense that which must have been so for this to and gives it voice and uh in you know wayward lives i mean it's man it, she's it's magnificent when you try to do that with a white supremacist what happens that's my question in the opening here that's what i'm trying to figure out so i'm basically in inhabiting Fainor and trying to figure out and that that's it. so that that um testimony that that uh statement from Re reconstruction Natchitoches I've been trying to figure that out for years you you can't even read it you can't even I mean you can't even put together what is happening that's really basically what I'm asking and from his point, that's from his point of view. But, but what is the moral danger? What is the, what is the moral hazard of reanimating his point of view? That's partly, I think, what you're asking and what I was trying, what I'm trying to figure out. And as an anthropologist, I think you know a lot about this that I would like to talk with you more about. It is absolutely true. So maybe there's a way to frame it. Um, but I want, I, I, I went back and forth. I mean, I, that's very deliberate language in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's a little chilling factoid. Natchitoches, uh, created at the end of Reconstruction a statue called the Good Darkie. That's its name. The statue was on display in Natchitoches until very recently, Andres, when it's been taken away. The Good Darkie. And there's some writing about it, and it's. <laughs> but it, I began to wonder whether the way that Fainor divides between the good man who was the sexton of the church and rang the bell and the black man who was incorrigible who must be a hero really whether that good darky statue is in honor of the man who was incorrectly hanged and i don't want to disappear these relations i want to try and see this through his point of view mm -hmm. now it could be that that's really a moral hazard and needs to be framed. But you asked me why, that's why. And, and because it aligns us, as you say, with the violence of photography, which says that we can identify the right person to punish. Can we? Can we? You know, and certainly not lynching. No, there's no right person to punish so th those are the so I find that even when we begin to put words to photographs we are entangled and um I th that's a choice and I maybe we can talk later about what's at stake in the choice thank you so much for your question uh, yeah anyway thank you so much um this has been a really rich and uh you know 
and 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 great exchange uh, and i uh, you've been uh, unflagging in your energy and ability to engage i mean uh, I, I, i've been quite impressed uh, and uh, and really really grateful for your showing up and 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 teaching us so much today thank you so much for everyone for the presence and the questions and the invitation and amazing help for me in sharing what really is very new work Thank you so much. That's exciting, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And Bye.